Now, I don't know the history on this one for sure, but I think that what we're dealing with is a nodule in the the um, the uh, vulva or vagina because we have it'd be either the um, labia minora or the vagina. I suspect because what we have here is squamous mucosa. It's got those vacuolated glycogenated cells up top and it lacks a granular layer and a stratum corneum. And down underneath it, we've got numerous small bundles of smooth muscle. So that's why I would suspect that this is um, probably from the vulva or, uh, vulva or vagina. And then what we have um, over here is a nodule. right beneath the mucosa. And the cells have kind of oval to round nuclei with uh, fine chromatin and a tiny little punctate nucleolus and abundant eosinophilic cytoplasm that has a granular appearance. It's kind of hard to appreciate on this scan, but it's kind of a grainy granular appearance. The other thing it has are these little blobs that kind of have a crack around them that separates them from the rest of the cytoplasm. These are called pustulo-ovoid bodies. So this is a classic example of granular cell tumor. Uh, granular cell tumors have this granular cytoplasm. They tend to have cytoplasm merging with each other, so they have a syncytial appearance. And it's like all these uh, cells are sharing the same cytoplasm. You can't easily see where one cell ends and the next cell begins, usually in granular cell tumor. Okay, the little pustulo ovoid bodies are quite helpful. Um, and the uh, other thing that's not shown in this case, but usually at least when they occur in the skin, you often have trickling of the tumor in between the adjacent dermal collagen bundles. Sometimes it can even infiltrate down into skeletal muscle when it arises in the extremities. Uh, but in this case, it's actually kind of a, a circumscribed example, but oftentimes they're infiltrative um, at the edges, and that's normal. Uh, the other thing to point out is the reason that the cytoplasm is so granular is because these cells are loaded with phagolysosomes. And there's a marker, an immunostain marker, that stains phagolysosomes. That's CD68. So we often talk about CD68 as though it's a specific histiocyte marker, but that's not true. It stains pretty much any cell that has phagolysosomes in it, which of course histiocytes do, but so do granular cell tumors. So it, the classic staining for granular cell tumor is strong expression of CD68 and S100 because these are nerve sheath tumors. They're just an unusual variation of nerve sheath tumor. So S100 and CD68 positive. PAS is often going to stain these granules. In all honesty, most of the time these are diagnosable, I think, um, by just H&E. If you really need something, an S100 will easily solve the problem for you. So granular cell tumor. A couple things to point out. The most common sites for granular cell tumor are um, the, uh, the tongue is, I think, the most common site, actually. And then I've also seen them in the anogenital genital area and also in the extremities. They can kind of occur in a wide range of areas. But the oral mucosa, particularly the tongue, is an important site to remember. And the reason that's important to keep this in mind is there's something that granular cell tumor tends to do. It tends to make the epidermis or the mucosa over top of it grow. And sometimes this growth can be really dramatically um, in, infiltrative looking. It can look malignant and, and what we call pseudoepitheliomatous hyperplasia. And so what can happen is the granular cell tumor can cause the mucosa or the epidermis to grow in a way that makes it get misdiagnosed as squamous cell carcinoma. So these cells are kind of more plump and large and they can look kind of atypical. And like I said, sometimes it can really have a pseudo infiltrative appearance. So the key is, is if you see the biopsy of something you think is squamous cell carcinoma, particularly on the tongue, look down here in the submucosal spaces between the islands of keratinocytes and see if you can find some granular cells because if you do, you should back way off from calling something squamous cell carcinoma. So I've seen examples where, um, where granular cell tumor has made very dramatic um, um, squamous changes that really resembled carcinoma. And I've heard of examples where it's caused misdiagnosis that was really problematic. So not every granular cell tumor does this, but it's an important phenomenon to know about that it can happen and you don't want to make the mistake of calling it squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Oh, the other thing I'll point out is remember, these are nerve sheath tumors. Perineural involvement by granular cell tumor is present in like 90% of cases. I, I can't remember if this case has one, but oh, here's an example of that kind of trickling, almost infiltrative appearance of the granular cell tumor at the periphery. Totally normal, benign finding, 
is common in granular cell tumor. But if you see granular cell tumor wrapping around nerves, that does not mean it's malignant, okay? That is a normal finding, just like a schwannoma arises from a nerve, just like neurofibromas often have involvement of a nerve, so do granular cell tumors because they are neural tumors. And, and it's there in like 80 or 90% of cases, okay? So don't worry about that. There are rare, rare examples of malignant granular cell tumor, and you can go and look that up on PubMed, and there's some real nice papers that explain the features of those, but they're rare and outside the scope of what we're gonna talk about today. So granular cell tumor.